Welcome to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. I'm Justin Nielsen, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ali Quorum. And today we have a special guest returning to the show. This was actually our first guest that Ali and I got to tag team against. Yeah. It's Scott St. Clair, and he is the senior product coach for MarketSmith, also an IBD panelist, as you can see very frequently on the IBD Live show. And uh, hey, Scott, thanks a lot for joining us today. Of course. Thanks, guys. Hey, Scott. Now, Hello. And uh, well, let's see. We're going to go ahead and cover a little bit about the current market today. Also, uh, in our second segment, we're going to get into some of the position sizing that Scott uses for his portfolio. And then, as we always do, we're going to end with some ideas uh, with some stocks and maybe how some of the position sizing rules that Scott uses comes into play with those. So, Scott, are you ready to start out with the current market, your favorite topic, right? Sure. Yeah, I love the <laughs> stock market, the, in, the overall stock market, that is. The right. overall stock market is so tough. I, I know on IBD Live, I mentioned if, if it was a poker game, I would never play poker with the S&P 500 because <laughs> you it it does the best job of masking, you know, its hands, so to speak. So it, it's really subtle, the changes underneath when things start to get better, as well as the opposite way when things are, you know, kind of um, underperforming. It, it just does an amazing job of doing that. Right. And, and so lately, mm -hmm. I feel like what we've been dealing with now, granted, we still have, um, you know, a fairly high distribution count, but that seems to be coming off. Some of those distribution days are dropping off. Um, but I feel like what we've been dealing with here lately is kind of a little bit of a range bound market with the S&P 500 here. We've uh, tried to poke above that 4200 level uh, a few times. I mean, we're, we're staying above it. This is the SPY, uh, which is SPY, the spider. Uh, so think of this as a 420 level for the, mm -hmm. the, the spider. And, you know, we, we, we seem to be kind of having trouble making much progress about there. But at the same time, it's not like we're going down that much and we keep on getting uh, support at the 50 day moving average line. So what, how are you handling the overall market? Yeah, it's a, it's the old adage. Um, it's a market of stocks rather than a stock market. Uh, I have gotten away from the overall indexes a little bit in the last few years, because like I said, they've just, they've just fooled me so many times. Um, but I don't, that being said, I don't want to, get too far away. Every time I think, just forget about the indexes, stop, stop, you know, don't even look at them. Um, I, it's, I'm reminded of, of Bill O'Neill uh, at a level four, where he said he, he really thought he should have uh, uh, put the M in front for can slam, because the M is so important. So I'm thinking, forget about the M, it's just too hard. And there he is telling me in my ear, you got to you got to watch the m it's the most important letter so yeah you're taking your cues more from the underlying stocks the stocks that you're tracking that meet your screening criteria and that's the biggest signal for you as a health of the overall market how many setups that you're seeing and and setups that are working do you feel like that's improved over the last week yes it has but in in different groups so the market has shifted and a lot of people have you know it's noticed this the oil and gas groups very strong and resources and mining and so there there seems to be leadership i own a number of stocks and like justin said the indexes are just going sideways it's hard to be negative on them because they're above all the moving averages but um you know, the old leadership is very, very tired. We were talking beforehand, Netflix relative strength is 17, you know, I mean, how, when's the last time yeah. Netflix had an RS of 17 and the stock is only 16% off its 52 week high. So, you know, it's not like it's getting beat up. It's just going nowhere. Um, and, and, uh, I guess maybe today it improved to 22, but earlier it was 17 when I wrote it down, uh, maybe it had, it must've, uh, improved today, but in any case, 22 is just as bad as 17. And so there, there's a <laughs> once, lot Once you of get that. down that low, does it even yeah, matter? <laughs> yeah. Apple, I think Apple's RS is probably in the 40s, right? Um, yeah, 40 on the button. So there's a lot of that in the, and these stocks make up the market. And so that's why the market's kind of, you know, going sideways. But well, well and, and you, 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 know, you kind of mentioned this whole idea of this, this rotation, um, and, and you mentioned how oil and gas, but it, it's, it's weird because there seems to be like almost a multi-phase thing going on here. Cause I mean, oil 
really, uh, you know, a, a lot of these plays, oil and steel materials, um, they've been really running since November in, yeah. in a lot of ways. It wasn't really until February that I think mid-February that it felt like the tech, like what you were mentioning with Apple, Netflix and all of those just really started getting decimated. And, you know, there, there were certainly some base patterns that were forming in like the oil and, and materials and stuff, but the technology, I mean, the relative strength, as you mentioned, it just really plummeted on those. And so is that shifting where your attention is? I mean, it's hard because a lot of these oil and gas, I mean, it's not like they're going to have uh, the canceling characteristics. They're not yeah. going to have earnings. They're not going to have all these things, but you know, how have you made that shift in your own portfolio or how much are you just backing away and saying, look, I'm going to wait for the growth stocks to come back. So I have a hard time backing away, Justin. I just love the game too much. You know, right. I, I am very rarely not in the market, even, even though I know that, that, you know, there's a time to be fishing, so to speak, you know. Um, but I just, I love the challenge and the, I think it's the greatest intellectual game out there. Um, and so I'm almost always in. And so, yeah, what you mentioned about those types of stocks, it's very difficult. I own three oil and gas stocks. And, you know, one of them has really big quarterly earnings, but the other one, the, the earnings are good, and the, but the revenue is like minus 30% or something like that. So it, they're, they're turnaround stocks. And so it's hard to decide and to find it very difficult to, um, to pick stock picking in that regard, because I don't know why XYZ is better than ABC drilling, which is better than, you know, DEF drilling. So when we'll talk about it probably later yeah. in position size is I just, maybe I just, instead of the old way would be, I want 10, 15, 20% in the leader. If I can identify the leader, now I might have 5% in all three and then wait and then see which one goes up the most. Maybe that turns out to be the leader and I can always move more money into that one and, and take money out of the, of the laggard, so to speak. Right. Well, we'll get into that a little bit more in the next segment, but also, so we're seeing this rotation in leadership continue. Tech is maybe getting a little bit better, but still we're not, we're not seeing those explosive growth movers uh, in a widespread way, but it seems like there are some bright spots in the IPOs uh, and some other speculative names that are sort of popping up on the radar. So what do you think that that says also about the overall health of, of the market and where we might be headed? Yeah, there's stuff to buy. I have stuff that I like that's made progress. Um, you know, I, when I look at the market, I, I look at most important to me is my account. Am I making progress? Right. Because if the market's going up and I'm not, then it doesn't matter that the market's going up. I'm out of sync. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's most important to me. Top of the list. Second to me is the stocks I own. How well are they doing? And then third is you know, like a, a jealous factor. Are there stocks that I wish I owned? That, um, that are acting really well, that gives me um, a clue that the market is, is uh, you know, in, is strong hand, so to speak. So these are all, it's, it's a giant puzzle. And that's what makes it so hard, but so fun is that you, you do, it's a thousand piece puzzle, but you don't need to have every piece um, to make, a, you know, a, an informed decision, you know? So you just, you just go with the, it's a, the best, decision you can make. And then if you're wrong, you, you move on and make, make another decision. And if you're wrong, you move on and, and then so it comes on. Down to so risk forth. management. Yeah. 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 So, exactly. you know what, two questions before we go to our next segment. Um, so first I want to ask uh, your, your thoughts on the Russell. We didn't, we didn't mention the Russell as we were going through charts. So maybe we bring up IWM to take a look at that. But also I wanted to kind of get your thoughts on the tight action that the NASDAQ composite has been showing. A lot of technology stocks, I feel like have been kind of doing this similar thing where they've been kind of trading a little bit tight, some of them above their 50 day moving average lines. Um, does that look like it's poised to uh, potentially do something or are you afraid that this might be another, you know, fake out like, oh, you know, it, it, it looks good until pull me once. Pulled, yeah, pull the rug out from under you. <laughs> once yeah. we get in. I, I, Charles Harris said something on IBD Live that I, I think was on IBD Live, but I found very, um, it just kind of hit home with me. He says, I, I, he goes, I almost always give the market the benefit of the doubt. Uh, so 
he's always thinking bullish and but that doesn't mean he's you know going to go over the edge but he he has this mentality that i'm always thinking that could it, that good things can happen I, I think that's the best way to approach it so i'm i'm open to the fact that the nasdaq could get going um, my spidey sense tells me it's it's not acting right. The relative yeah. strength. Look at the right. relative strength line, Justin. So poor. Yeah. That that's the issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's just really. It's like a reverse basketball being under <laughs> held underwater. You know the <laughs> right. the uh -huh. S and P. The overall market is so strong. It's dragging the Nasdaq up. Yeah. Um, and so if the S and P were to weaken, I think the Nasdaq would weaken. Would, would weaken quickly and a lot a lot more like so that that's my fear and so right now i don't have a lot of what i would consider tech or nasdaq exposure mm -hmm. uh because um of that that relative strength you know in comparison to the other indexes um bothers me just enough mm -hmm. let's take a quick look at small caps uh, before we go to the break so seeing improvement here which is good to see yeah, I don't, it, it it just doesn't look negative. You might not be positive on it. And that's the thing. You don't always have to be <laughs> bullish or bearish. That, you know, there's nothing wrong with being neutral, right? And I do a weekly video for um, Market mm -hmm. Smith of like a end of week video. And I use traffic lights as, you know, on the mark. And I just use, I've used yellow, I think like five or six weeks in a row. It's just yeah. like, it's it's neutral. I'm not, I'm not bearish on it. I'm not bullish on it, I, you know, in, in and I'm just in between, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. All righty. Well, as we hinted at, we're going to talk more about position sizing after the break. So we will dig into that on the other side of this commercial. Do you want to conquer market volatility? We can help you protect your hard-earned capital. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how Vantage Point's AI technology can forecast stock market trends up to 72 hours in advance with incredible accuracy. Vantage Point's patented technology analyzes huge quantities of global data in seconds, so you can finally stop guessing what's going to happen next. Check out www.freestockcoaching.com and experience Vantage Point for free. Learn how successful traders generate their wealth. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Welcome back to Investing with IBD, sponsored by Vantage Point. Allie and Justin here with our guest, Scott St. Clair. Now, Scott, you talked about with this rotation that we're seeing into stocks like oil and gas plays, you are changing your strategy instead of maybe one, having a 15% position, having three with 5% positions. So can you explain a little bit more about the, the reasoning behind that? Yeah, so a little bit of it is like I mentioned, I don't know which is the leader. And so um, I'm going to, you know, spread it out a little bit and let the market kind of tell me the leader because the stock selection criteria that we have is very good. But if the companies are turnaround, then it's a little bit more difficult, right? There's no earnings on the table. The market is anticipating these earnings. And so it's very hard for me to try to know which ones are going to be the leader. So Instead of 15% in XYZ, maybe I do 555 and then um, ramp it up if, you know, three, six weeks later, I have one that's performing a lot better. The downside to that is I own a lot more stocks than I normally like to have. I try to cap it at 10. So if, if a normal position is one, which is now three, I do that two or three times, you know, I can easily get to nine stocks and, and you know, I'm 30% invested. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't want to do it for everything, but I will, I've found I've done that in this, this year for the, the areas that are a little bit, I don't know, foreign is the right word, but just more difficult for me to, to judge resources. Well, comfortable. <laughs> yeah. A little true. out of your wheelhouse. Yeah. Mining stocks, you know, um, you know, energy, oil and gas, et cetera, mm -hmm. those types of stocks. So when you're talking about your shifting of money, so, okay, so you start everything off at the starting gate with 5%, let's say, um, at what level do you start shifting things? Because I mean, you know, with, with some of these industry moves, it feels like they're all moving uh, in, in a positive direction. So at what point do you start saying, oh, you know what, I'm going to put more money on this horse? Usually I'm looking just for, for the stock to move, right? Just, just if this, if I buy it at 20 and it's 21, 22, I love to buy more of the stocks that mm -hmm. are going up. 
Um, it just, just always, you know, force feeding the, those winners. Sometimes I, you know, can get a little bit over my skis too fast doing that, but I'll just let the ones that go up, I'll add to those. Uh, and then, you know, I'm, I'm big on scaling in and scaling out. I, I try not to put too much pressure on myself during the day with all or none decisions, right? Unless the stock mm -hmm. is acting really poorly, I rarely get out of anything in one fell swoop. Mm -hmm. um, well, I guess my point was more though, uh, you know, again, let's say you've got three oil and gas stocks you yeah. know, again, because it's an industry move, a lot of them are going to be moving up but some might be moving up faster than others. So are you, uh, you know, using the money from one to shift into another, or are you kind of scaling in with, you know, a, a, a whole different thing and kind of leaving everything as is and just putting a little bit more into some and not others? Yeah, the latter, I think. So do you mean, am I worried about having too much exposure to one industry group? Right. Or... So, I mean, are you adding it to all of them, you know, yeah. sometimes or... Are you like, oh, you know what? I'm going to scale back on this. Because again, what, what I used to see Bill do is sometimes when he was not sure who the leader was, he'd be putting money into a couple in the same industry. But then what he would do is once, you know, a couple of weeks were going by and he could kind of see how they were acting, he would say, okay, you know what? I think that the one that's the leader is, is this one. And so he'd just slowly start moving money from the, the laggard into the leader. Um, yes. And that was, that was, you know, sometimes he would keep them both, you know, because, uh, you know, they were both going up at a similar rate, but uh, usually it was after a few weeks, you know, that he'd be making, making those shifts. It's been a little bit harder because this rotation doesn't seem like you get more than a few weeks <laughs> before, yeah. you know, you get some type of, you know, again, this range bound issue. So I, I was just wondering if there was any similarity to how you're, you're handling it. I prefer to have larger positions. So having five, I'm a little bit antsy, to be honest with you. I don't feel like I, there's enough, you know, pe uh, enough pedal to the metal with a 5% position. So you're right. I do want to try to take it to at least 10 or 12 if, if I can justify it. And if I get, if I don't feel like I don't want to do that, if I go 15, if I have 15 in three oils and then I do that for three of them, now I've gone to 36% right. invested in one group. I don't want to do that and either. And a commodity, so, no less. <laughs> yeah, I, I, will, I will dump one or, or you know, one and a half of the other ones. Mm. So yeah, it's, that's what makes it hard to, to know. But yeah, I, I always like my original plan has always been 10%. I like 10% as a starting position because it's easy and it's enough I think position size is, is so important. What made me pick this topic is I was yeah. listening to Joel Greenblatt, who's a hedge fund manager and, and billionaire. And he was talking about, he said, position size is, is everything. It's the most important thing. And I agree with him wholeheartedly. I think most people spend a lot of their energy on stock selection, on chart patterns, on these things, and they don't think about position size. And Position size is very important to personality wise too, because um, what he said was that resonated with me was Tesla last year. If you had Tesla and you had a 1% position in Tesla is what he said, he goes, that was your worst trade of the year. But Tesla had a fantastic year last year. How could that be your worst trade? Because you identified a big winner and you didn't move the needle on your whole portfolio. So if you caught a five fold move in Tesla, your whole account moved 5%. That, that's not going to get it done. You know, you want to move your account 30, 40% when you identify a big winner like Tesla, they don't come around that often. And it's a, it's, it tells a great story. You can go to cocktail parties and tell your friends and neighbors, you know, I own Tesla at 80 and now it's 600, but my first instinct when people tell me that I never say it because I don't want to, it's, I don't want to go down that road. <laughs> you don't want to be say, kicked out of the cocktail parties. Yeah, <laughs> I want to say, well, what's the position size? Right. And, and I, I'm certain if I asked 90% of the people that I talk about, they wouldn't understand. What do you mean? What's the position size? I'd have to say, well, how much of your liquid net worth of your portfolio is in Tesla? Um, because they wouldn't think that, you know, so it's, it's hugely important. And it, it's what's, and there's a fine line. You can, you, you want to have enough that if you get it right, it moves the needle, but not too much that you can't sleep at night. Mm -hmm. 
And that number is different for the three of us. And it's different for the 3000 people that will listen to this. It's, it's just, it's very uh, personality oriented, how risk averse you are. And what we talked about, Justin, um, as you get older, um, I meant me, not you. I meant as, as, as yeah, you, I'm like, what are you talking about? As, as I get older, I should say, um, it, it, I think about that as well, because, you know, I, I can't, what I did at 25 years old in my account would, would make um, the 50 year old Scott's heart stop. <laughs> yeah, there's a difference between when you're trying to build your account to, hey, I'm trying not to, you know, not not to blow up. Yeah, <laughs> my yeah. account. You, there's a there's a fine line. I want to make progress. Yeah. I want to do mm -hmm. well. I want to make money, but I'd also have to understand the amount of risk I'm taking uh, to do that. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it's 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 difficult position size, but it's uber uber important. Everyone should sit down and map it out. Write it down. How many stocks do I want to own? Okay, I want to own ten. Okay, if I own ten, that's ten percent position. Um, can I, can I live with that? And then I always think, all right, if I have 10% of my money in a stock and it gaps down 10%, let's say it goes right through my stop. I'm hoping to get out four five, 6%. Let's just say it gaps down 10%. My whole portfolio, I'm going to lose 1%. Can I live with that? You know, From that I, one stock. That's right. Yeah. And we talked about it, Justin, because then I say, okay, well, what happens if I own four stocks that do that? What if there's a market event? And four stocks that I own with 10% positions gap down 10%. Now I'm down 4%. Well, if I'm up 25% on the year, you know, that's going to hurt. I don't want that to happen, but I can stomach it. Mm -hmm. But if I'm, you know, up zero or down 2% on the year, I can't stomach that. I don't want to go down six, eight, 10, 12, because it's hard. Once you dig a hole, it's the math yeah. is cruel trying to get out of that hole. Exactly. Yeah. So super, uh, super important point there, Scott. And also I feel like something that goes hand in hand with position sizing is this scaling into positions and your first podcast episode that you were on, you talked about pyramiding into positions. Can you talk a little bit about your approach now? Uh, maybe you, you've changed, changed that a little bit, how, how you're getting in there. Yeah. So the standard is 50, 30, 20. If you want a thousand shares of XYZ, you buy 500 and then you wait. If it goes up, you know, two and a half percent roughly, you buy 300 and another two and a half percent, you buy 200. So that's the standard practice. So, um, you know, one thing I, I think you want to be flexible, right? That's one of the words that Bill, Bill would say. Bill wrote it yeah. in a book. He wrote it down, but yet he's willing to be flexible and change his mind. And I'm big on being able to change your mind. I love listening to Stanley Druckenmiller. And every time he's interviewed, every podcast, he always says, I reserve the right to change my mind. Yeah. I, I love that. Why aren't we allowed to change our mind? What's so, so wrong with that? <laughs> but anyway, so yeah. I've decided that, you know, I've changed my mind. So I, I, once I get a, an initial position, uh, I'll do a second ad. Uh, and honestly, I don't, I don't have any perfect formula for how I'll do that. If I have five, a percent, then I'm, I might go to eight, you know, add another three. If I'm already at 10, if I'm putting on the, the original position size, which is 10%, which I normally like to start with, I might only go 12. I might just go up another two. Uh, the third buy I've found is, is I've just kind of, um, I don't want to say I've given up on the third buy, but I don't do the third buy that often because I've noticed that every time i make that third buy, the stock goes down from that price. Right. <laughs> it market puts that puts pressure on me. And so I've just said, well, I know it's, it's supposed, I'm supposed to make this third buy, but based on, you know, my post analysis and seeing mm -hmm. what I've done hundreds and hundreds of observations, I don't have a very good track record on that third buy. So maybe I ought to stop doing that third buy. <laughs> Stop doing what's not working. Yeah, yeah. Uh, words to live by, and 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 it makes sense in this market environment. Again, yes. it's it, here again, Scott. You you get the to reserve the right to change your mind because if the market starts trending in a way, I'm sure that third uh, buy will start looking more attractive. You'll start doing your post analysis and you'll start saying, "Gosh, you know, a lot of these stocks are going up significantly from my second buy. I, I think I need to put a little bit more in there." Um, exactly. But right now, with the range bound action you know, that third buy is probably coinciding to a top, top of the range and it's about to fall into the, you know, 
into its corrective phase again. And so. what's kind of moved me away from NASDAQ type tech stocks in the last few months is that the I make the first buy and the stock will go up. And, um, and they, I found that they can go up. They just can't stay up. Right. <laughs> so a I lot would more try, breakout failures. Yeah. And, I tried C limited, which we might talk about later. I tried Roku. I tried, um, you know, uh, um, net all software. the old favorites. <laughs> yeah. These are stocks that I love because they uh -huh. were so good to me in the previous cycle. So, you know, you kind of go back to those same horses, but they, they just, it wasn't working. They would go up and it just enough to make me think they were working and then come back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I just, you have to, uh, after a few observations, just say, oh, maybe, maybe there's something wrong here. And, and, and then the, you've pivoted to these other stocks and they're going up and not coming back. And then the jealousy factor, which I talked about, I believe like Denberry, D-E-N, that stock yeah. drives me crazy because right. I don't own it. And I saw it breaking out. And when it broke out, it was right at that moment when you're like, why do I want to own an oil and gas stock? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and like you mentioned, November of last year, you know, coming out of that uh, cup. And, and so you don't own it. And then it never gives you a chance right. to get in. Exactly. That's, mm -hmm. that's really good information. You know, I, you start to see that. And I've noticed that in the last few months. And like, this is, this stock won't let me in. Maybe there's more, there's more to this group move than meets the eye. Right. Now, real quick, because you were talking a little bit about, look, if you've got, you know, a number of these oil and gas companies, and you've, you know, you've started scaling into them, uh, you certainly don't want to get to a point where you've got 45% invested in, in one of those sectors. Do you have a limit for any one industry group or any one sector uh, that you say, okay, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go over this, this level for my position sizes to the, my exposure to that sector? I don't, I don't have a number. I used to, I used to have a number, which is 50%. I, I didn't mind being 50% in one industry group. At one time, many moons ago, I owned uh, 100% with like Facebook and LinkedIn. I think there was one other stock, um, but that was like, you know, maybe eight or nine years ago. And in your youth. Yeah. <laughs> and it put a lot of pressure on me. Yeah. I was having a hard time sleeping, you know, and so I, I decided I, this is probably a bit too much. So we, we all, I would love to have, you know, my dream is to buy XYZ at 50 and watch it go to hundred and buy more and more and more. And pretty soon, you know, it's your Bill O'Neill. You've got a hundred percent of your money in this huge, huge leader. Um, I've thought I've dreamt that many times. I just, I, I can't execute that because of my personality. It just, when it just gets, I just love to, to bring the cash register, you know, when they start to go up. So the short answer is no, but I should, I should, I should have a number. You're right. And there again, it could be one of those things that's personal uh, where yeah. uh, I, again, maybe you have more comfort with certain sectors and you feel like you could go a little bit more, but oil and gas, maybe it's like, okay, I'm not as comfortable here. And, you know, I'm going to have a little bit, you know, that limit is going to be a little bit less. And I should well, also you... point out that bill, uh, I, I will say that like, I would say 2005 maybe was the last time I saw him go mm. Uh, you know, that heavy into that. single stocks. But yeah, he, he, he even got more conservative as his account grew to a point where he was like, yeah, may, maybe 100% is a little too much. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the sec there's the sectors and then there's the, you know, the industry groups. And so the sectors are really large. Um, and then you have like, you know, the whole, I guess the resource thing, like would mining and, and these be considered the same so you could really, you know, kind of go down a rabbit hole. But so I, I do look at industry groups. So like oil and gas, U.S. exploration, to me, you know, those stocks are pretty much all the same. So I, I don't want to mm -hmm. have, you know, I don't have a number, but I, I, I think subconsciously I do think about that. Yeah. So for those who are new to thinking about position sizing, it seems like 10 stocks at 10% seems like a, a good place to start or, or to start thinking about, but also it seems like position sizing is a function of the market 
that you're in. We, we, we've been talking in recent months about, you know, playing small ball and also the personality of the Sox too, right? You would treat an IPO differently than you would treat an established slow remover, like a, like a long-term leader. That's yeah, a good point, I'm, Allie. I'm glad you mentioned that, Allie, because that's so important it, in, you know, 10% in each name is suboptimal. It, it, it is, you know, ideally I want to have 12% in this one and 6% in that 15% in that based on the quality of the company, how far I think it can move the risk reward, but it's very difficult. I, the reason I got this book super trader out because he's uh, Van Tharp is very big on position size. And he has in the back of the book, he has 20 different models on position sizing. And, and Bill just kind of has, you know, one. And so, you know, there's probably a sweet spot somewhere in between, but I've tried to use some of his and they're just very complicated. You know, it's, you know, Kelly criteria we talked about or the, the you know, all the others. So I think you want to just kind of make it easy. And that's why I like 10, 10 positions, 10 stocks, 10%. Um, Certainly makes the math easier. Yeah, it's super yeah. easy. When I go to buy a stock, even I can see what 10% of my Roth IRA is and, and, and do the math, how many shares to buy. So Cause you're managing how many accounts, Scott? <laughs> well, I, I have a lot. I think I, we, I think I counted 15 yesterday when we talked about between uh, family and IRAs and kids accounts and stuff. Uh, and it's, I, I don't know, maybe I believe in this. I know I've seen this work for myself and I've seen it work for other people. And so I, I want to have uh, as much of my, um, liquid assets in these stocks that I think are going to go uh, as possible. Well, to that end, uh, when we come back, we'll take a look at a few of these stocks that are currently on Scott's radar. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Do you want to conquer market volatility? We can help you protect your hard-earned capital. Visit www.freestockcoaching.com and find out how Vantage Point's AI technology can forecast stock market trends up to 72 hours in advance with incredible accuracy. Vantage Point's patented technology analyzes huge quantities of global data in seconds, so you can finally stop guessing what's going to happen next. Check out www.freestockcoaching.com and experience Vantage Point for free. Learn how successful traders generate their wealth. Trading involves financial risk and is not suitable for all investors. Past results do not guarantee future performance. Welcome back to Investing with IBD podcast sponsored by Vantage Point. Now, before the break, Scott, we were talking a little bit about how many accounts you manage for, uh, for your family members and kids and everything like that. Um, how do you do that exactly? You know, is it one of those things where you're buying different stocks in each account? Uh, maybe, you know, more of the, the, the names your kids recognize, or are you just kind of doing the same thing in all of them? Yeah, the latter, my son would have probably doubled his uh, Coverdale if I'd listened to him because he told me to buy Roblox when it came out, right? <laughs> Roblox and nothing but Roblox. Yeah, <laughs> just put it all in, Dad, you know, <laughs> pedal the metal. Well, see, that's the thing with youth, right? Uh, <laughs> I should have let him manage the account. He'd be probably be doing better. But I, yes, I buy the same stocks across all the accounts. It's just easier for me to manage. Uh for myself, my IRAs, you know, my wife's IRAs, I, you know, the margin account, I just go down, you know, the little drop down in the, uh, in the trading platform. And I just do the math if I'm using 10%, you know, and I just go all the way down. I do, um, you know, for my sister's account, my sister's law, sister-in-law's account, I've found that I'm a little more conservative. Yeah. Um, it, you know, it's harder, at least for me to manage other people's money. I'm more risk averse for them which is both good and bad. If, you know, um, there have been years where I just got, oh my gosh, Scott, what are you doing? But for myself, um, and so my, you know, my sister, when I do poorly, she doesn't do as poorly, but you know, if I do really well, she doesn't do as well, but um, you know, she, she's okay with it so far, <laughs> but yeah. They, it's, they it's, trust you. Yeah, it's, and it's, e I find it's easier just to have the same, positions in all the accounts because it has happened to me before where and you now it's like oh my gosh I forgot I own XYZ yeah. for my sister and I stopped out of that you know two days ago for myself or whatever so um, I, I try to match them all up uh, accordingly 
Definitely. Well, let's dig into a couple of stocks that are on your radar now, uh, kicking things off with a breakout stock this week in the oil and gas sector. We have ticker OVV, Oventiv. So a really nice cup with handle breakout here, Scott. Yeah, the pattern is what um, jumped out at me this weekend. Uh, you can see today's, uh, well, today's Wednesday, but been two trading days with the holiday. So on Sunday night, it just looked like a really, really great pattern, a great setup. And um, it was in the growth 250. It, you know, if you're doing your, your weekend homework, you, you don't miss this stock. If you're on IBD Live on Tuesday, you missed the stock because I didn't have my order in to buy it on the open and it uh. moved, moved really fast and I was you know, on the show. So I didn't, get, didn't own that. I, I wanted to buy that as it went through that pivot. And then you got uh, but, Arusha telling you, you know, haha, I have it. Yeah, you know. and, and Arusha, <laughs> Arusha owned it already. You know, he's jumping the gun, breaking all the rules again. <laughs> 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 but uh, th that also shows how disciplined you are. And I think that that goes back to the conversation about position sizing, about scaling in, about making sure that you're not buying extended stocks. Well, sort of. I appreciate the compliment, Allie. <laughs> I wish I was as disciplined as, as, as I should be, but you're right. It, I didn't get the pivot that I wanted. When, I, when my initial buy, at least the very initial buy, I want that to be you know, spot on. I want that to be at the pivot. In fact, almost always it's sooner. Um, I just want to get a position in it because then it's easier to buy. If I don't get that initial pivot, then then I'm reluctant to, to chase it because I, I find that I'm just like, I'm all out of whack. I'm buying here. I'm selling it on a normal pullback. I'm buying mm -hmm. it again. So I passed on it, unfortunately, at least so far. Uh, but it, it also, it goes back to that jealousy I talked about. The stock's acting really well. It came out of a pattern and it's up, what, 8% uh, in two days. You know, it tells me that this is the right area. These types of stocks are, you know, are still working. Mm -hmm. Eleven percent. So we're continuing to see this uh, group be fertile ground. Yes. And next on our list, let's talk about uh, an area that you've shared with us in the past. You were in URA uh, to play uranium. Now you're in URNM and it continues to act well. Yeah, I've been in this for months, which is a record for me. I usually don't stay with ideas as long as I've stayed with this one. Uh, but I, I just have like this thesis, this hypothesis that if the world is gonna um, go green, if we're gonna all be driving electric cars, the electric grid, you know, as we sit here today, cannot handle that. Um, um, so, we, you know, nuclear is, is highly probable idea and they're you know the world all over the world they're building um a lot of nuclear reactors and i think uranium is you know priced at like 30 dollars or something and in 08 i think it went to 190 or something crazy so uh as long as it holds that 10-week line that's that's my process that red 10-week line uh it dipped below it for one week, but it kind of closed in the upper range. So I, I left it, but I'm just looking for a close below that line on, you know, ideally it would be a close below the line on an increase in volume. That would be my sell signal. Otherwise I'm not, I'm just gonna do nothing with it. And it's an ETF as, as you can see, which makes it a little bit easier uh, because I, I don't have the, you know, the, the uh, the single stock risk, although you know all they're all uranium mining stocks in there. Right. Maybe they're all one and the same, right? But um, it is an ETF, and so I, I have a little bit larger than normal position in it because you know of it being an ETF. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you say a little bit larger, like how how do you shift that? Because again, in in this case, you are getting multiple stocks. Granted. I think that there's a couple that are very heavily weighted, you know, CCJ that you've talked about. Yes. Uh, you, you, you brought that up on, on, the, on the show before. There's an, also another uh, one that trades on a London exchange. That's um, a heavy weight in there. But so how, how comfortable are you saying, okay, you know what, because I have exposure to a number of stocks, um, how, much, how much further up do you go? Or is that, a, again, one of those things where uh, there, there's not really a set limit? Uh, 
for the, for yeah, the sector I mean, necessarily. If it keeps going up, I'm just going to leave it. And it, you know, mm -hmm. and the thing is, is it goes up, it becomes larger and larger percentage. Right. right. And so, yeah, it's grown to a pretty good size position. I think it's 25 the last I um, looked, mm -hmm. which is um, why I don't like to look because it scared, <laughs> scared me a little bit. I was like 25. Yeah. Wow. I didn't realize, <laughs> I didn't realize that it had gotten that large, but you know, some of that is obviously from price appreciation. So um, I'm trying not to watch it. it, it my thesis, like I said, is, is that red line. Um, and as long as it holds that, then I'm comfortable with that. If it starts to get really stretched from that line, then, you know, and I'm always thinking, okay, can I withstand a, a pullback to that right. red line? You know, yeah. so as I sit here today, that's like an eight or nine point pullback. Um, that would be hard for me to withstand. So I, I want them to just I like, you know, if stock goes sideways and the lines start to come up, then, then I know, you know, um, what my risk reward is. And if it starts to get extended from that line, then I, I might, you know, go ahead and trim some mm -hmm. scale in and scale out. That's the way I prefer yeah. to do it. And so is we, there a certain level that you're looking at in terms of extended from that 50 day line? No, uh, I don't have a, a percentage I, for a stock. I do. I think there's, there's numbers you can use for like a stock, but this, you know, this is in ETF and it's very um uh, specialized not the right word but you know it's you know what 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 they're doing is is you know very unique versus versus having like a you know an emerging markets etf or something like that so i i don't know i i'm i'm all bold up on it i think it goes so much higher uh it's, it's sometimes we all think that you know we 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 love the ones that that go up we you know, love them even more so um i'm trying not to do anything with it which for me is 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 not the easiest thing you know i've i've always been an active trader but um i just kind of leave it so far so good mm -hmm. Two quick things uh, from me here, Scott, before we move on. First is for someone listening or watching, where do you think a, a good new entry would be for something like you are in M? And then also you talked about a close below the 10 week line as your line in the sand to get out. We often talk about a decisive close uh, on a weekly basis being 2% or more by week's end. Is that what you're using or are there are, you know other factors that you're looking at? Because because clearly here, the, you looked at the support here because it closed this week uh, in late April, 2.8% below the 10-week the line. So there's definitely an art to it uh, in addition to that 2% close that we look at. Yeah. So the week it was closed below the line, it definitely did that. It triggers the rule for me. But two things, it, the volume wasn't up versus the previous mm -hmm. week. And the range, if you look on MarketSmith, you have, there you go, you have the closing range of 50%, which tells me that when it came in, it got support. If it had closed at the low of that week, uh, highly likely it had got me out. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then maybe I have to get back in if it goes back through the line, which, which is fine. You know, you can always get back in. It's hard or you don't want to do that. It's not, not like I want to sell it at 60 and buy it at 55 and do that all over and over. That's, that's impossible. It's, you know, but um, if I feel like I need to protect myself, then I get out. And then if I feel like, Oh, I made a mistake. Um, I, I I'll get back in, but I survived the pullback on that one. Mm -hmm. I think my two favorite ways to buy stocks are a base. That's the easiest way. Wait for a base. It did break out of a base. What? Five weeks ago. Um, if you don't get a base, then, I would buy it off the 10 week line. So if I didn't already own it, you could have bought it, you know, when it came down through 53 there and then there, right there, Allie, exactly. That would be the day that you, that that's your buy signal. It's, it's gotten support mm -hmm. off the 50 day or 10 week line. And that is 428 for those of you listening to this, but we also have the video version. You can check out at investors.com slash podcast. So we'll keep an eye out on URNM. And last but not least, let's take a look at SEC Limited, a really hot stock in 2020. But uh, compared to a, a lot of other growth stocks, this one, this one's definitely hanging in there. Give us your take on what's been going on. 
Yeah, I have a soft spot in my heart for C Limited because that was my best name in the you know the the COVID bull market um, after the I don't want to say after the crisis because it doesn't seem like we've really ever gotten <laughs> completely out of it at least so far. But um, so it was really really strong stock and beautiful move. It's just amazing move. I you know and, another and one of those that didn't really give you much opportunity to get yeah. into it. <laughs> that ten week line, you you look how it respected that line and never closed below it for the the whole move until about what eight or nine weeks ago. Um, so that if you owned it for that, that'd be your sell signal, which is fine. You know now maybe it's setting up. It's not a great base. Uh, it's it's kind of my go to stock. If I think I want NASDAQ exposure, like it, let's pretend the, mar- the NASDAQ is in a, in, in a downtrend right now and we have a follow through day tomorrow, uh, I would go buy C Limited. That would be an easy decision for me that I want to, I want exposure and it's a, the, a f- fantastic company and it's kind of the Amazon model. You know, you look at, there's no earnings, but the, the revenue growth is just stunning to me quarter after quarter. They had one little hiccup in, uh, in, in September 2020 where they where only did 99%. Yeah. Wasn't triple digit. <laughs> Under, other than that, look at that. I mean, what's that? Six, eight quarters of basically triple digit revenue growth. So, um, you know, now they're losing money and, you know, they're pouring the money back into the business, et cetera. And the sponsorship is really good. There's some really good sponsors in there. Uh, it's made a big move. Uh, it's a late stage base, you know, so it is a four stage base, uh, but um, it, it's, it's like I said, it's my go-to stock if I'm trying to get uh, exposure in, in the NASDAQ. And, and now this being a later stage base, and again, not just a later stage base, but this is one that, I mean, it had such a phenomenal move. How much more do you think you can get out of it? Uh, you know, how much more is, you know, just being like greedy, like, you know, didn't, didn't, didn't you do enough? Didn't you get enough? Scott? Yeah. How it, do you make that determination? It's a good, a great observation, uh, Justin, because w- Facebook, when it made its first big move, like 30 to a hundred, then it got really hard to trade. It went up a lot. It went from a hundred to 300, but it was a very difficult stock to trade because there was a lot of false starts in there, a lot of hiccups, uh, fake out breakouts, mm-hmm. bounces. So you have to decide, okay, am I just going to buy C limited and own it? Or maybe I would use it to trade. So if I bought it coming out of this four stage base, I would be looking to take profits. If it went up 10, 15, 20%, um, I would, that's how I would play it for sure because of the later stage uh, base. Now, fast forward, you know, two, three years from now. And if we have a, a bear market and the thing corrects 50%, then I, then I would change my mindset a little bit, but it, um, it doesn't, you know, the thing about it is, I, is, you know, the, the NASDAQ is not that great. And a lot of other stocks have come off a lot, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't want to go down. <laughs> I wish it had got hit 50% and then would build a new base. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I do think about that a lot when I'm putting on a position. Most definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much for all of your insights today, Scott. And don't forget, you can catch him every week on IBD Live as well, along with us, uh, investors.com slash IBD Live and his weekly videos for Marcus Smith subscribers. So make sure you check those out as well. Thanks so much for your time today, Scott. We really appreciate you you coming on the show. Yeah, it's fun. Hopefully you'll have me back um, another time. We oh, will. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> we will. We look forward to it. All right. Well, that is it for this week's show. And coming up next week, we have Joe Fami of Zor Capital coming to shed light on his take on the market, stocks that he's looking at. So we look forward to his perspective as well. He also is going to be on IBD Live coming up on Friday. So make sure you check that out. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in, everyone. And we'll see you back here next week. And for this week's notes and charts, make sure to go to investors.com slash podcast, where you'll find details for each episode in the podcast episode section. And make sure to subscribe, rate and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. 
everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.